Hi, everyone. Welcome back. We're here today with our Total Wellness Tuesday episode of the week. And today we are going over my take on the DASH diet and actually looking at the pros and cons of the diet. Now, the DASH diet, if you haven't heard before, this is a clinically proven diet that helps lower cholesterol, lower blood pressure, and helps a lot of people with metabolic syndrome, which is blood sugar dysregularity, uh, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and other inflammatory-based factors. So what I like to do, too, is because I'm going to give you, again, the pros and cons. Not everything is good, but at the same time, it's important to give due where due is due. And that means going over the actual benefits of this particular diet from a clinical-based perspective perspective. So whenever I talk about that, I say, okay, let's look at really what does the science say? And if you've never heard about the DASH diet, it is important because this is actually a fairly easy diet to follow by most Westerners. So I'm a Westerner, right? So anybody in America, but also, you know, European-based companies, Canada, Australia, et cetera. So the whole Western-based culture is really what we're looking at, people that follow the standard American diet. And again, the standard American diet is spreading around the world. I saw this firsthand when I did internships in India, and especially firsthand when I saw it, when I went to China uh, to do a clinical internship in Beijing. You could see actually the first generation really overweight and eating Western-based foods, McDonald's, etc. Now, here's the interesting thing. I don't necessarily recommend a DASH diet for individuals. It's not exactly the healthiest diet, I would actually say. I mean, truly, and I, I know that um, this seems kind of strange because there's some real good clinical benefits behind it. However, it can be improved. But what I'm saying is this. Let's say that this is for a parent of yours, a grandparent of yours, a friend or coworker that can't really make the jump to eating like a super healthy diet. And we'll go over what that is in a moment. And of course, probably if you're a longtime listener, you know what a really healthy diet looks like. But this is a diet that they can definitely follow. And if they have high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and other um, comorbidities, this would be a really great first step. I always uh, liken this to back in the day, there were these small little gyms called Curves Gyms. I don't know if you remember them, but like 10 years ago or so. And they're probably still, some are probably still around. And all they were was like eight machines, right? It's from the beginning. And they would take a client in, like multiple clients at a time. And the client, all they had to do was go through these eight machines and follow their basic nutrition plan. Now, is doing the same eight machines essentially every single workout a phenomenal workout? No. Is following like a base diet all that great? No. But they were able to get many people, and, and it was mainly a, uh, I don't know if it was only women, but they, it was at least uh, marketed more to women. They got good results, right? They got good results for so many women. And that's why when a lot of people were making fun of like curves in the industry, I actually said, hey, this is a great first step for a lot of people intimidated about going to a gym, hiring a personal trainer, or following some nutrition plan. This is a good thing. Let's celebrate this. Let's give appreciation to these types of spots because those people then, as I say, they may graduate to that next level, right? So sometimes there has to be an entry-level program. And that's kind of what I look at the DASH diet. It can be phenomenally healthy and beneficial, especially if you're going from the standard American diet. Okay, so let's get into it. But remember that I have to give you a reason why I'm doing this. And so a lot of people say, well, just tell me what the DASH diet is. It's not about that. You can read about the DASH diet online. You don't need to listen to a podcast on that. What I'm doing is I'm trying to give you clinical perspective every single podcast on why these things may be beneficial in the real world. Because if you look at the DASH diet online and you're an integrative health practitioner or a doctor or someone implementing these protocols, you might say, I'm not going to implement this. This is, this is not as good as what I'm doing or whatever it might be. And I'm not disagreeing with you, but remember what I just gave you as an intro is maybe this is a first great first step, okay, for people that are non-compliant. All right, let's get into it. So standard American, uh, sorry, the DASH diet stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. Okay, it's a, it's a fun little anacronym, right? So what does that mean? Well, dietary approaches, so this is just a specific nutrition plan to stop high blood pressure. Hypertension is high blood pressure. Great. How does it work? Well, it's high in potassium. It's high in calcium magnesium. 
Why would that be beneficial? Okay, high in potassium and magnesium are actually the two most important factors. And that's why, again, we use a lot of magnesium in our practice, especially with people with higher blood pressure. Now, are we using it as a treatment protocol? No, we're using it because they may be deficient in magnesium, right? So we're building up that deficiency. Why does that work? Magnesium, think about your artery really, really tight. Again, if you're watching this on video, um, great. You can see the analogies. If you're not, you can head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 2111 to 111, uh, or you can watch right on YouTube. So you get an artery right here, having a difficult time to get in that blood flow through that causes what? High blood pressure. Okay. Now magnesium relaxes, right? It relaxes this artery. What does potassium do? Potassium moves you more out of that sympathetic nervous system. So magnesium actually halts the sympathetic nervous system. Potassium promotes more of the parasympathetic nervous system, which is that vasodilation and relaxation. So uh, potassium, obviously huge needed, and I like getting potassium more through food than I do through high-level supplementation. Uh, a little bit's okay. And then uh, and magnesium, which is totally fine uh, through nutritional supplementation, but of course, definitely whole food as well. What else does the DASH diet do? Because it's not just the higher in minerals. Okay. It's going to be higher in fiber. That's a big thing. A lot of fiber on the DASH diet. So all these people saying fiber bad, all that, just you have to understand it's, it's just not true, right? If you have digestive issues and you're staying away from fiber or vegetables or fruit, et cetera, I just, again, I just want to reiterate, go back, listen to all the shows I have on that. It is a digestive issue. You are fermenting those vegetables or sugars or carbs in your gut and it's causing gas, right? It's causing bloating or digestive issues. It's not the food's fault. It's your gut. It's imbalanced. You can fix that in 12 weeks maximum. And then you can enjoy all the benefits of all these phytonutrients, which are brightly colored fruits and vegetables that help do what? Well, they act as antioxidants. When you look at longevity, I'm doing so much research in longevity. I'll be teaching so much more in January. You have to understand all of the main nutrients right now that help with longevity are essentially antioxidants. Now there's a, a couple outliers, but they're antioxidants. Trans resveratrol, antioxidants, even uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide acts as what? An antioxidant, which then helps the mitochondria. Quercetin, antioxidant. Does it do other things? Yes, but it acts as an antioxidant. How about PQQ? Yes. What does it do? Acts as an antioxidant. Helps with free radicals. So again, you have to understand, we can get them from our food, brightly colored fruits and vegetables, uh, but also we can get it from nutrient nutritional supplements as well. All right. Um, Dash diet does this, lots of potassium, lots of magnesium, lots of fiber, low saturated fat, low sodium, okay? That's essentially the DASH diet. But let's give you a better breakdown at what that looks like per day. So average sodium uh, per day uh, is about 3,400 3, milligrams uh, for the average American. DASH diet maxes it out at uh, 2,300 milligrams, and uh, they have a lower sodium version for 1,500 milligrams for people with hypertension. Again, uh, conventional medicine doesn't, doesn't understand this quite as well, but potassium would allow you then to eat more sodium. Uh, it's sodium and potassium that balance each other. So again, if you have more potassium in your diet, you can certainly eat more sodium. But again, I'm not giving you a medical advice right now. I just wanted you to know that, that it's not sodium's fault. Uh, sometimes it's just straight salt, right? With your table salt, it's not a real salt, it's not a Himalayan salt, but regardless, you still need potassium to balance that sodium, right? Okay. And again, I can get into the kidneys and I can get into the adrenals and how they affect sodium, but we won't do that for today. So let's get right into the DASH diet of what it is. And I'm going to link this up at 2111. So if you want to take a look at the actual graphic of the DASH diet, I'm happy to do that. And this one is from the uh, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Okay, so the DASH diet, and again, you can le leave your kind of, um, you know, I guess you can judge it along the way for how you feel. That That's fine. I was going to say leave your judgment for the end, but that's okay. We're, we're going to go through the whole thing. So... Again, I just want to state clinically proven to help lower cholesterol and lower high blood pressure, mainly clinically proven for blood pressure. Obviously, that's the name of the DASH diet, right? For stopping hypertension, stopping high blood pressure. But it actually has a beneficial effect on cholesterol for many people. So what is it? Six to eight servings per day of whole grains. That's a whole lot of whole grains. I'll tell you that. That's a whole lot of whole grains. So that's bread. It can be whole grain pasta, whole wheat this, whole wheat that. So six to eight servings per day of whole grains. Could be rice, could be oatmeal, could be bread, could be pasta. 
It's a whole grain, right? So that's what it is. All right. So the next is four to five servings per day of vegetables. Interesting though, right? Well, well again, we'll get into this then, but like six to eight servings of whole grains, but four to five of vegetables. Very interesting. Four to five servings of fruit per day. Two to three servings of a fat-free or low-fat dairy. So they're okay with the carbs from dairy. They're okay with the protein from dairy. They're just not okay with the saturated fat from dairy, right? So that's how they lower their saturated fat. Okay. Next up is four to five servings per week of nuts, seeds, and legumes. Okay. Interesting. So they're not allowing even one serving per day of nuts or seeds or beans. Strange, but interesting. Less than six servings per day of lean meat, poultry, and fish. You might say, well, that's a lot. Technically, it's not, because when we look at the servings, we're talking about a couple of ounces. So really what they're saying is uh, a couple servings per day of uh, lean meat, poultry, and fish. Now, that means not a lot of fat, not high fat, right? So we're talking about maybe more uh, chicken breast versus uh, a dark meat chicken. We're talking about a leaner cut of beef, like a 90 plus percent lean beef, uh, et cetera. All right. Less than five servings per week of sweets. So again, this is a transition diet because you're basically saying to someone, well, uh, Every day except Monday and Wednesdays, you could have a little bit of candy, a little bit of ice cream, low-fat ice cream, et cetera, all right? And then two to three uh, servings per day of uh, fat or oil. Now, they've got some strange fats on the list, right? Some vegetable fats in there that we're not a huge fan of polyunsaturated fats, especially oxidized, uh, but they do allow some of that in there. So um, what I would say is, and I, why don't I give you like a, a daily uh, dash meal plan, all right? So that you can kind of see what this looks like in order. And then what we're going to do is try to make it a little bit better, okay? So this is just one example. Uh, for breakfast one day, they would do uh, rolled oats, some cranberries, and a little bit of honey. And then for lunch that day, they would do some hummus and veggie sandwich on whole grain toast. A snack would be dried apricots and almonds. Dinner would be salmon, Brussels sprouts, sweet potato fries, uh, some carrot, celery, onion, tomato salad. And then a snack at night would be grapes with Romano cheese. I'm going to pretend I didn't even read that. Uh, grapes and cheese, probably one of the worst food combinations in the world, especially right before bed. But again, we're transitioning, right? All right. Another day is, uh, let's see, Greek yogurt, granola, honey, and strawberries. On lunch, for lunch that day would be salmon sandwich or, or on whole grain toast. The snack would be some dried mango and walnuts. Dinner would be chicken, sliced peppers, red cabbage, corn tortillas, homemade guacamole, homemade guacamole, and then the snack would be almonds with, uh, sorry, some apples with almond butter. I think you get the idea. Um, that's that's basic. Let me give you one more. Another day would be multigrain toast with avocado and an egg for breakfast. Uh, lunch would be shrimp and pasta and sliced veggies. The snack would be celery with almond butter. Then it would be pork chops, quinoa with dried cranberries and broccoli. And then before bed, it would be pears with cinnamon. So we're basically looking at two to three meals a day with some type of animal-based protein and uh, and a dairy in there, right? So that's kind of what we're looking at. And then we're looking at um, definitely some, some larger servings of uh, grains in there as well. So when I look at that diet, I say, you know what? That diet, besides that bedtime snack, could be and could work for a lot of people in this world. It really could. And it would be an improvement, and here's why. Instead of having a mu muffin or a bowl of cereal for lunch, they could do oatmeal. I think that would be a much better choice. Do I think they should do a cow's milk yogurt? No, but maybe it could be a goat milk yogurt or sheep milk yogurt, which is much less of a sensitivity. Maybe could, they could throw some fruit in there. Maybe not, not bad, right? Not bad. For lunch, they're doing, uh, this is salmon sandwich on whole grain toast or sliced chicken and veggies or shrimp and pasta. Okay, the best meal, no, not exactly, but it keeps them away from having pizza for lunch or 
a sub at lunch with just some like cold cuts, which we know are, are terrible for our health, right? And then what about that snack mid-afternoon? Well, I would love them to fast from lunch until dinner, but we do. We used to do this in our body transformation practice all the time. Some people need the snack. They just they want the snack. They need the snack, or they're just going to eat cookies or uh, pastries or whatever in the afternoon, anyways. All right. Well, some uh, carrots and hummus. Celery with almond butter? Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll go with that. I'll go with that as a, as a mid-afternoon snack, a couple hours before dinner, a couple hours after lunch. And then dinner. The dinners aren't too bad. They're doing uh, a quinoa or they're doing a, a cabbage they have there one day. They're doing a piece of fish. They're doing shrimp. They're doing whatever it might be. And uh, they are uh, overall doing pretty well, not, not a whole lot of grains uh, at that dinner. And then they're doing that snack before bed, which is just not ideal. If you're looking to get deeper into autophagy, it's just not ideal. But again, if someone's used to having ice cream before bed, what do we do? Sliced apple and, and almond butter, much better choice, right? Just much better choice. You get a little sweet, you get a little salty, you get a little bit of fat in there, a little protein to slow that digestion of the, uh, you know, carbs a little bit in the apple. So anyway, it's just a much better choice. So what I'm saying to you is this, this could be a good transition diet for parents, grandparents, friends, siblings that are not eating well right now. They're eating you know, fast food at night, they're eating a sandwich or pizza for lunch, uh, they're grabbing a muffin and cereal, they're just not eating a lot of veggies, a lot of whatever it might be. So this is really an easy diet to follow. And there's a lot of pre made meal plans that they can ship you following the uh, the uh, the dash diet. So I just wanted to share that with you. Now I did say, how could we improve this? All right, it is not difficult to improve this. So you can still follow a dash style diet by doing even if you wanted to, lower in saturated fat. I've got lots of podcasts on saturated fat. I'm not demonizing it. Again, we're not going to talk about that here today. But what I'm saying is this, you've got six to eight servings of whole grains per day. Why is the DASH diet doing this? Well, they're going whole grains over processed. Whole grains are going to have more fiber. It's going to have a little bit more nutrition. People will start throwing out words like plant toxins and lectins and gluten, and, and all of that's true. And well, plant toxins isn't true, but they're, they're throwing out other techno, technical-based terms. What I would say is I agree that the less gluten you can take in, that the less gliadin you can take in, the better for your gut lining, the better for the gut wall, and the better for inflammation. So I would love to keep those uh, six to eight servings of grains, and I would love to drop it way down to either zero or one or two for your oatmeal in the morning, and then maybe a little bit of gluten-free grains such as quinoa, millet, amaranth, wild rice, etc. That's a much, I, I would much prefer that without a doubt. And then for people with these particular conditions, I like doing that at, at lunch and breakfast rather than at dinner as well. So I agree with that part. What about the four to five servings of vegetables per day? Way too low. Now again, good transition diet because if you're eating muffin pastries at breakfast, sub or pizza at lunch, you know, or sandwich with sandwiches with cold cuts and then take out at night, you might be getting one to no vegetables per day right now. I don't know if you consider like, you know, a few slices of lettuce in your sub vegetables, but okay. So you're getting like one. So four to five, certainly, you know, one or two cups at lunch and one or two cups at dinner, definitely an improvement, right? But we want to get you to seven to nine. So replace some of those starches with more vegetables. That, no doubt about it, would get people better results. Because again, we've seen this clinically, quarter million people in our, pra uh, in our practice, quarter million client appointments, uh, for sure. So more veggies, less grains. Okay, what about the four to five fruit per day? You know, they didn't put this on their, on their meal plan either. That's hard to get in. Uh, and, and honestly, probably not as beneficial as more vegetables for this particular clientele. So I would rather say one or two fruit per day, lower glycemic, an apple would be fine, but definitely get in more of those berries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, strawberries. Uh, those are great. Kiwis, great. All of those would be very good, right? No doubt about it. Okay, two to three servings of uh, dairy per day get rid of it. No need for it. Uh, if you're going to choose dairy, choose a uh, goat or a sheep-based cheese, yogurt, or kefir. That's going to be a better option, no doubt about it. Cow's milk sensitivity. If you haven't done your food sensitivity yet, uh, it is the number one food sensitivity that we see in our practice. We've run tens of thousands of food sensitivity tests. It is number one uh, across the board, I meaning nine out of 10 people we see with cow, but we don't always see it 
with goat and sheep, meaning like only one out of nine people seem to be sensitive to the goat and the sheep. Again, I've, I've different podcasts on why that is. All right. So next up is the four to five servings of nuts, seeds, and legumes. Well, I'll be the first person that, that, to tell you that you don't need to eat nuts, seeds, or legumes in order to be a healthy individual. Some people do better with, uh, without them. But if you were to replace one of these next, you get six servings right per day of, of meat and fish and eggs and all that. You replace a little bit with that with beans for one meal, chickpeas for one meal, hummus for one meal. Um, I think that would be a much better choice and, and you would see better results as well, especially if that six servings of meat, fish, eggs, et cetera, per day is not grass-fed or pastured. It's going to make a huge difference because remember, inflammatory-based meat or inflammatory-based fish or eggs are only going to add more inflammation to the diet. All right, uh, five or less of sweets, yeah, one, one, one per week, right? One per week because here's why. Most people, when they have it, then they crave it again. Think about your kids. If they start getting used to having dessert two nights in a row, they want it every single night, right? I mean, that's, that's just the way our bodies are hardwired. It starts to get wired into that. So cut it out for 21 days if possible. You'll see dramatic results. Add it in once a week, maybe twice a week, and that would be fine once you reach your goals. Two to three servings of fat and oil per day. I have no problem with that. Just choose the healthy fats and oils. Choose your avocados, your olives or olive oil, uh, unoxidized. Uh, you know, choose even if you want to do a little bit of grass fed butter, ghee. And I know that you say, well, it can't be from cow. Remember, there's no protein virtually zero and there's no carbs in butter it's virtually zero so there's less reactivity because there's only fat and your body's reacting to the protein the amino acids essentially in that so again i've chosen that as well but that is how you would dramatically improve the dash diet just small tweaks and you get even better results so hopefully this was helpful for practitioners but also for everyone out there that this is a great transition based diet it honestly is for people that are following that standard American diet that want to eat healthier, but they're not ready to stop snacking between meals. They're not ready to give up their bedtime snack. This is a great transition. It is clinically proven to help with cholesterol, clinically proven to lower blood pressure. Uh, and again, like I said, it's a great transition diet. And then I think you can improve it even more. Hopefully this was helpful. I'm happy to do a more advanced version. I'm happy to answer questions for you. You just let me know, leave them in the comments and, uh, and happy to help. So thank you so much. Please do feel free to share this show with anyone you believe it could serve. 